Hi, welcome to Med Health Fit, the TV show that integrates wellness and healthcare. And tonight, our topic is food. And we have a very interesting expert on food, Melissa Cohen <laughs> from the Isla Vista Food Co-op. Welcome to the Hi, show. Hi, Eric. Thank you for having me. We go back a few years. You have been a fantastic sponsor to some wellness programs at the university. And as far as I can see, you run a heck of a ship out there <laughs> in, uh, in Isla Vista. So how long have you been part of the Isla Vista community with the co-op? Oh my gosh. Well, I started there actually right after college as a sandwich maker. So I started working in 2003, the summer after I graduated. Okay. And I kind of came and went a few times. And I landed back doing this work in 2006. Um, and I've been there straight shot through. I was given the opportunity to be our first education and outreach manager in okay. 2006, and then I took over as general manager in 2010. 2010, so about eight years. Now, yeah. I've seen during that time, and, and let, me, let me sort of step back a little bit, you know, my wife was a member of the food co-op in the 80s, mm -hmm. and I sort of jumped onto her membership in the 90s, and I, I think we were members up until probably 2008, 2010 or so, just because of kids and you know whatever. Mm -hmm. We just never made it out there. Well, as I said before we went on air, my youngest son is on an airplane right now to Detroit, Michigan to finish off uh, his you know, fourth year of college. And so he's been out of the house now for, for you know, a year, and so we don't have any kids anymore, so we, we need to sort of get back in there. But, but, but my point here is that in, in that time, when we went to go shop at the co-op, and when I was in there a month or so ago to talk with you, I really noticed a difference. I mean, your <laughs> stock room is twice as big. You have more things on the shelf. You have more people who are uh, in and out of the, uh, of the office, uh, you know, the storefront. You know, they're in, outside doing something. They're packing or unpacking. Mm -hmm. They're doing, you have other people around the side of the store. You have all these, you had a whole row of tables of people like doing the administrative stuff. Yeah. You're growing. We are. We built a business out of what was a business that had an opportunity to kind of build upon its original mission right at the right time. I think when the community and the state and the country are looking at groceries, not just as let me go buy some groceries, but an experience or something where a grocery store can start to be a little bit more for the community. Mm -hmm. The timing was as such that Isla Vista was able to kind of rally around the co-op finding its new footing um, with a different generation of general manager. Uh, it coincided with us having our facade improvement when there was redevelopment agencies in the county. Okay. The co-op was able to get a grant and do our facade lift. And so for those that haven't been out to the store since 2010, which is plenty of people, it's a totally different storefront that allows for way more opportunities to gather. We have classes, we have workshops, we have the garden boxes, um, mm -hmm. we have our community compost bins. and so. Through the last nine years, we've been able to just grow and then add different layers to what we think the cooperative has really been able to uh, step fully into. And, and one of the reasons why I've wanted to have you on this show is because I think that you can speak to the mission mm -hmm. of what a community storefront is. So explain to the viewers who may have never been to the food co-op. They're watching Channel 17 or they're YouTube friends of mine and they're local and they're like, well, gosh, I've never been out there. So tell us a little bit about what a co-op is mm -hmm. and, and why is it sort of, you know, this thing for everyone? Yeah, this is a really tricky thing. Actually, what we found in national data about co-ops is most people have no idea what a co-op is. Mm -hmm. So there's many different types of co-ops. There's electrical co-ops, there's farmers co-ops. Actually, we have right here in Santa Barbara an example of Sunkist is actually a growers and a producers cooperative. So when you buy from Sunkist, you're buying potentially from farmers right here in Goleta that grew oranges and they sold into the cooperative. Not the national Sunkist. The national Sunkist. Oh, really? Is actually, called Blue Diamond. You really? might get your almond milk almond? from Blue Diamond. Cooperative. Those are farmer and producer cooperatives. Makes but that sense. Organic Valley, who many people buy their milk, or Organic Prairie, uh -huh. that's a ranch. Those are cooperatives. So it basically allows people on their own that might not have enough resources to come together and to share in anything from production to manufacturing to marketing. Mm -hmm. So we are a consumer co-op. It's a specific type of co-op that's owned and controlled by the people that use the service. 
We're the only consumer co-op in the Central Coast, the only one in the county. And what it means is that the co-op started by people in the community back in the 1970s, mm -hmm. early 1970s, students and community members that wanted to have an option of a place to get their food that wasn't owned or controlled by anybody outside of their community. Right. And when you do that, you give people not just a place to buy food that more represents the specific community that it's in service to, but also a voice and what that business might do within the community once it's accomplished its goal of selling groceries, for example. That's what we do as a consumer co-op. Right. And so the misconception about the co-op, I think, is that it's like Costco. You have to have a membership. You have to show a card to get in the door. That's well, actually I, I not think true. We, I think we used to 20 years ago. Well, probably more than 20 years ago. Right. There's very few co-ops at this point that would require you to join the co-op in order to shop there. When it first started, it was like that because that was the point. You actually volunteered labor. There was no markup. And right. so in exchange for your service and right. your labor work, you got groceries exactly. at wholesale. Mm -hmm. That is a really limiting business model because it doesn't account for damages or... People, things getting spoiled, and so that's when you start to talk about the grocery industry or any business having a margin where you have to actually have a cost of goods and you have to adequately run the business with which to support when food goes bad or when you want to start to have a workforce that can afford to sell groceries and live in Santa Barbara. Right, so the right. co-op is a business owned and controlled by the people that use its service. Anybody can come shopping. You can join the co-op and then you get extra benefits, which to me, most importantly, include your voice and your vote. And you actually can vote for your board of directors, run for your board of directors, and help steer the cooperative in terms of finances and strategic priorities that are passed to me. I'm an operator. I'm the general manager. So I'm hired or fired if it doesn't go well by the board. And I'm able to take strategic priorities that the community has said is the most important thing. Right. And then we create our operations around those shared goals. Right. That's so, how the so, works. and again, it was it's it's been a while since we did, and I know that there was some sort of a membership card or something. Yeah, there's back still in that. It's an ownership share. So okay. It's the same thing. So, but today, if I'm a, a a new resident of Goleta and mm -hmm. I'm driving through Isla Vista and I see the co-op and I say, hey, you know, I want to come in here. What's the pitch to me? Would you like Stop. to join? Please come in. You just no, want, you well, just want to let's say that I'm already in there, and yeah. I'm like I came in to buy coffee, the, the, you know, Great. a few weeks ago, and, <laughs> and uh, but I should be a member now. We would love for you to join the co-op. There's so many rejoin, reasons. Rejoin the co-op. We would love for you right. to rejoin the co-op. Well, first and foremost, when you give us your money, that becomes working capital for the store. So any right. business owners out there know that cash flow is the most important thing to healthy business. Right. We right. never have enough cash because we're operating a grocery store, and we have to invest so much in products to purchase to sell. Some of it sits on the shelf for a while, and so you're spending money, and you hope you're picking stuff that turns fast enough right. to refill the cash coffers, but it's hard to have enough cash to do all the things and make the long-term investments in things like the physical infrastructure of the co-op, for example. So when you join the co-op right here, right now, your money you give us goes on our balance sheet, so we are liable for that. Mm -hmm. That's equity you've put into the co-op. It's kind of like buying stock but the stock never changes in value, you change its value by how often you shop in the store right. because you have benefits that are attached to your account. If I'm a corporation in town and you approach me to be a corporate member, mm -hmm. I could write you a check for $10,000. You could, and but it wouldn't change the amount of voice you ownership. have and how the business runs. It's that the same is the as, distinction. The same as model. anyone else who comes yes. in and, and they're going to... And that's a great gonna, example, actually. So in a corporation, right. traditional investor owned, the more shares you buy, right, the more, the more voice votes you, you have. Exactly. In right. a co-op, there's actually shares called preferred shares. So somebody could invest more money into the co-op and we say, thank you. Here's your one vote. So no matter what, you can have a million bucks in your bank account or a dollar. Once you put your equity into the co-op, mm -hmm. you're all equal. And that is the uniqueness of our business model and what allows it to be when we say democratic member control is one of the seven cooperative principles. Those are international principles that every co-op in this world ascribes to that allows us to, even though we're all different in countries all over the world, there's an estimated five billion people using the services of a cooperative around the world right. every day. And, and, and I just read, a, I just read a, an article in Ojai magazine or something mm -hmm. Uh, and there was an interesting story about some of the farmers in, uh, in Ojai, and some of them are working in the wine industry, some of them are working in the fruit or vegetable industry, and there was one lady who I see at the, far at the farmer's market every Saturday who is in the herb business. She grows lavender and mm -hmm. lemon 
peel or whatever. The, the, you know, and she makes wreaths and she makes all these very interesting. But it's co-op. She has people who come in and help her out. And I, and I never knew this. I just walked by her 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 stand on Saturdays and. I read this article about her and I said, well, this is very interesting how she's making this business be successful because it's very hard to be a farmer even yeah. if you have stuff that people want to buy all the time. Correct. Well, the greater you know, good economy is something I think that we move past really quickly in this country. And this, you know, I'm saying this from a point of privilege where I have a job and a livelihood and the security and my basic needs met. I believe that we can have businesses that exist for a greater good where there's people that might take personally less because they know it helps the person next to them have a little bit more. Right. And the cooperative business model is about that at its, you know, at its at the heart of hearts of the cooperative model allows for more people to exist in a healthy way. It's not communism, it's not socialism. There is structure it's in place. Right? It's right? It's cooperativism, yeah. exactly. On my LinkedIn I say I'm a cooperativist and that's right. real. It's because there's some of us out there that feel like we can lead these organizations forward mm -hmm. in a way where Everybody's benefiting. Well, I, and I want to get into a, sure. a, a couple other questions here in a second, but 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 you know, I I have in my career balanced the uh, uh, the, the aspect of working for someone else. I worked for a company in New York City. I worked here uh, at Sansom Research, which was a nonprofit. And I've worked for a number of years at the university, but I've always had a small business on the side. Mm -hmm. And I've always tried to juggle this whole thing about you know, the, the entrepreneur and, and the capitalistic aspect. And I look at what's happening in America with capitalism in, in you know, I, I should write a book called In My Lifetime because you know, here I am in my mid-50s right now and I'm like, this has all happened since the 1960s. Oh, you know, yeah. In the 1950s there was this Economically, there was a more steady as she goes mindset, but here you've got people that are just, you know, grow business, $150 million, six years, mm -hmm. sell it to a bit, you know, whatever. So, speaking of that, you, you and I spoke before we went on air about a book by Steinman. Yeah, and, yeah and John to me. Steinman. So, this is actually great timing, I was going to say. In John Steinman's book, Grocery Story, which just came out about two months ago, it's the promise of food co-ops in the age of grocery giants. Mm -hmm. And this book is pretty remarkable because half the book is the history of corporate grocery in this country. I didn't even realize, so I have a shared birthday with Ronald Reagan, February 6th. The same year that I was born, 1982, Ronald Reagan was president, same birthday as mine, which I think is just a weird coincidence, but he's the president that kind of abolished the antitrust laws that held into place the inability for a corporation to over exceed like the market space essentially. And so groceries were growing and growing. We talked about Kroger, we talked about Meyer, starting with Piggly Wiggly, the first little grocery store that had in this country. Mm -hmm. It was the first all-in shopping opportunity where somebody could show up and it was a one-stop shop. Right. The first formation of what we know to be a supermarket. Over all these years, uh, a bunch of different big grocery corporations were forming across this country, but the antitrust laws kept them separate. They couldn't monopolize. They right. could not band together to outcompete local business. So Reagan economic generation is what shifted the lens of this country into bigger support of corporations and prices started to be driven down. And then it became an out competition of local business. And so right. it's a really interesting part of the book that John talks about where he identifies this moment in our history where communities became a little bit more destructed through their historic lens of having a business culture that created a strong social infrastructure within that community. Right, right. And so it's an interesting. interesting time for us as a country because so many people are used to going shopping in a big supermarket and that a supermarket is what you would equate with having everything that you need. Right. And so we're not so sure that that's the right way of thinking about it because no matter what, there's somebody curating your experience. You just might not see them because in a supermarket, it's a regional person way out of the area right, making, making that's the decision. making the decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you might have 10,000 cereals to choose from, whereas at the co-op you might have 10, more than 10 cereals, but it's my example. Um, at the end of the day, somebody still chose for you what's going on that shelf of the giant supermarket. Right, and, and that, that segues into a, another part of the conversation we had before we went on air about Michael Pollan. And what I think is one of his interesting, more interesting videos is that why does a carrot cost more than a Twinkie? Mm -hmm. And if you think about Twinkies from a manufacturing, marketing, selling standpoint, you've got 
I don't know, flour, dough, sugar, whatever you have to, to, to a thing you have to, yeah. to put into a pan <laughs> with 100,000 other little Twinkie things. You have got to inject it with some white, goopy sugar stuff. You got to put <laughs> it into an oven and bake it, which so you've got the energy that's in. Then you have to let it, you know, cool. You've got to put it into something. It has to be wrapped in, in, in a specific type of machine, which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars or you know and you've got them all over the country making this so it's individually wrapped it's put into a box it has to have been graphically designed mm -hmm. the, but the, you do you it know. once and that's what we're talking about that's the right. difference that carrot is different every time and that's every true year that the environment changes or the soil is a little bit different or more topsoil arose as we start to take 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 from the soil and not put back in which is the big challenge of corporate agriculture in this country we have seven inches of life for our whole globe, it's topsoil. Everything has to grow in that seven inches. Right. Every year that we erode by not putting more back in, that's right. a problem. And right. so that Twinkie, yes, it was an investment, but that graphic design, that manufacturing plant, the level of automation, if that's the way you say yeah. that, automation, 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 that happened once. And then right. it kept on manufacturing. And there's less right. hands that have to touch those Twinkies. Right, but, 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 but the question I think, the bigger question that he's making is, is that in America especially, mm -hmm. people don't know anything about how a Twinkie is manufactured. Uh, I actually went into a, what, what's the big donut company out here? A Krispy Kreme. Krispy I went, Kreme. We were, I was at a basketball tournament with my son years ago and they said, well, we're gonna go to Krispy Kreme. And you get to watch how they make these things mm -hmm. and it's like a Willy Wonka thing. It's amazing. It's, it's amazing. amazing. We have but the what, mechanization of our food but, industry is one of our biggest triumphs, one of our biggest Challenges, right? Honestly, so and but but Paul and basically says most people don't even know that a carrot is a root and it actually comes from the ground. Totally. So agree. so we have an entire generation, and I and you're talking to a guy who grew up in Mid Michigan, yeah. And a lot of people in my high school were pig farmers, soybean farmers, corn farmers, uh, cattle farmers, and milk farmers. Mm -hmm. So I had you know I I know Tim, his dad was the what you know and PGA, his dad, you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. I, I knew all these kids. Well, their dads were farmers. Well, one of the, Gail, her, her dad, he sold his farm when I was in high school, and he got paid pretty well. And that was the mindset in mid-upper mid Michigan. When you had farmland and you were having a few years of trouble, there was somebody back in the 70s and 80s that could buy that from you. Absolutely. And this, herein lies the problem, is that if, if I'm a corporate bank <laughs> and I get into financial trouble, we know it's going to happen, I'm going to get bailed out. But if I'm a farmer, and I have a few, I mean, you look at the drought we had here in California. I can't imagine the, the almond farmers and the strawberry farmers and, and a lot of the other types of farmers, how they were dealing with juggling the crop and, you know, the, 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 and any well, of that Farmers stuff. are like the most quiet secret superheroes. Farmers and truck drivers, honestly, in this country. Mm -hmm. Those that grow our food and that those that have to transport it. People don't understand what farmers contend with. And it's interesting for us at the co-op because we don't have all local produce, but we do pride ourselves on our direct farm produce. It's usually between 20 and 40% of every produce dollar we spend goes directly to the hand of a farmer. Mm -hmm. There's no middle people because we're blessed. We're here in Goleta. We're the second biggest agricultural county in the country. Mm -hmm. We also export out most of that stuff. And it drives me nuts because people live here in Santa Barbara and I, and I will say a caveat, there are so many reasons why people choose where they grocery shop or how it chooses them. Mm -hmm. You know, life has so many things, convenience, um, you know, financial, right. you know, skill set, you know, what's the easiest. And it's a place of, I say it regularly, it's a place of privilege to sit here and have a conversation about having the opportunity to choose where we grocery shop. Um, I think that there's livelihoods at stake here in Santa Barbara County as the cost of living here gets more and more and more, but the insane pressure on the farmers to keep their prices, prices as low, low as low, possible, right. mm -hmm. and people don't realize what they're contending with. You know, it costs money to put an input back into your soil and be an organic farmer, as Absolutely. I was saying earlier, not just take, take, take. And some of these big corporate industrial organic farmers, because there's, there's tons of organic food across this country that you can buy. A difference of supporting a corporate organic farm versus going to a farmer like you know Miguel from Evie's Organic Farm that uh, works over in Goleta. Uh, Miguel is one of our longtime farmers. Mm -hmm. We buy direct from him for many years. He has to come up with funds to re-inoculate the soil with compost or with you know worm castings to make sure it keeps producing in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Corporate organic is probably going to be doing less of that. 
they'll get to a point of take, take, take. At some point, you have to put inputs back in. Right. But it's just a different perspective on how we tend the land. Mm -hmm. And then the face of the farmers is totally different when you actually are getting a more mechanized process. Bunny love carrots. They're actually local. They're from Kuyama Valley. Mm -hmm. Bunny love those little baby carrots. It's a pretty crazy process for the people that also exist right next to that you know, plot of acreage where bunny love farms. It's bunny love, super cute, like all the bunnies everywhere. It's not quite like that when you have a farm that's like thousands of acres right. and very mechanized. Yes. So I'd rather buy carrots that are coming from Alex Frecker mm -hmm. or from Miguel or from mm -hmm. a different farmer where we have a little more connection to the carrots having roots. Maybe they have dirt on them and maybe that's okay. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, th the whole issue of food in America, at least people are talking more about it mm -hmm. because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it, no, it totally. wasn't really a big deal. Totally. You, just, you just went to the store, you got it for cheap, you bought some wine. I saw a recent report documentary that America throws away over 30% of its food from grocery stores yes. and restaurants every single day. It's insane. I was mortified because I remember when I was in kinesiology program, we talked about the energy cost of just raising one cow from calf to slaughter and the amount of water, the amount of grain, yes. the amount of, yes. and now we have all of this mechanization, tilling, storaging, packaging, you know, getting on a truck, delivering, you know, just, just distributing all this kind of stuff. And a third of it goes into the landfill. And to me, it's like, because the banana's not straight enough, help me. Help me. Well, we feel grateful that other countries like France have actually made it illegal to dump produce that's of good quality because it's, quote, ugly. So the co-op mm -hmm. advocates for ugly produce. So you'll see stuff on our shelves. It's like imperfect. Tastes great. I had a Girls Inc. tour come through the other day. and We did an experiment. We actually gave them nectarines that were going to go into the compost because they're very ripe. And our compost, actually, we have two composts at the co-op. The one that takes the co-op's, you know, waste before... Um, First, it goes to the workers. If the workers don't want it, it goes to worm bins. So we've mm -hmm. been composting for worms for like 30 years. Bill Palmazano, a local compost superhero, takes our fruit and vegetable scraps and he brings them all over the county because he holds worm boxes at all these elementary schools. Right. And so that stream of waste is unique because it's very like closed loop. So at the co-op, when we have an item like those nectarines, they'll get pulled from the shelf. They'll be sampled for customers to taste, of course, or they'll go to our workers. We don't give to the food bank first. We first give to our workers to make sure that if you're working at the co-op, where we can't pay a million dollars an hour, and you live in a place like Santa Barbara, or you're a student at the university, and it's very expensive here, right. we're going to make sure you're not hungry. But so the waste stream has a lot of places it can go before it has to go to a dumpster. We're blessed in Santa Barbara because we also have a county compost program. And so that's when food gets to that place of not being edible. But those girls from Girls Inc. that tasted those nectarines, they're blown away. They're just ripe. It was just ripe enough exactly. that maybe somebody wouldn't buy it. And so other countries have made there be systems of checks and balances so that produce won't be tossed. And then expiration dates and sell-by dates are a big question right now in this is, country. Is this a U.S. Department of Agricultural thing? I think it's USDA, and okay. I believe that there's a labeling program in process right now mm -hmm. that's going to change the tag that is different than just use-by or sell-by. They'll be like an eat-by. And so there's, okay. a, there's a pilot program happening right now to help people be less scared to throw away their yogurt the day that it expires. There was a man, I think he's Mother's Markets or Mom's Markets, I can't remember which chain, but he's the CEO or the president. He and his family lived on expired food for a year. One thing that they opened actually was visibly like, we shouldn't eat that. Everything else they ate. Well, when it was I was fine. a kid, that, when I was a kid, everyone's mom or grandmother, you know, you had canned foods, or my grandmother yeah. did canning, and you'd crack it open, and if it didn't smell good, you'd toss it. If not, eh, yeah. let's eat. Yeah. You know, so in my grandmother, she canned foods. She she grew almost all of her own foods. Her yeah. compost pile was six feet tall, mm -hmm. and at the end of the winter time, when the chill came, it had like the the, the richest blackest dirt. Uh, ever and well, so she possible. had really good food and all of this is possible because like industrial compost is a big deal now meaning that there's processors just like we're in this quandary about plastic like where is the plastic actually going maybe just to the landfill there's counties including Santa Barbara counties and talk for another industrial composter so we can start to look at alternative ways mm -hmm. to allow goodness to go back into not the waste stream but the stream of agricultural like you know, um, regeneration, basically. Right, well, and, and UC Santa Barbara has the Department of Public Worms, yes. and yep, yep. they actually teach students how to learn about composting yep. and gardening and, and, and all of these things that go into it. When I was in college, 
I don't know what we learned. Well, we anyway, have, that's another question. Hosted, and we host a compost <laughs> workshop once a quarter with the county and with Department of Public Worms at the co-op. There's usually 40 people that show up. And so you can look at the co-op's calendar of events and see mm -hmm. all these little ways that we're partnering with people outside of Isla Vista and even outside of the university to teach what's possible. And again, it's a tiny little grocery store mm -hmm. that suddenly has a really big mission. Well, so one of my questions here is, do you see that you have room to grow here? Do, I do, you, do, yeah. do you have a? Is there going to be a Montecito food co-op? Is there going to be no, a I don't downtown so. Santa Barbara food co-op? I don't think so. I don't mean a funk zone food co-op. I don't know. It just sounds well, cool. It sounds cool, and the reality is that grocery is pretty saturated in downtown Santa Barbara. There's a lot of groceries. Okay, um, I got there's that. There's sprouts opening up on Milpas. The reality is that yeah. groceries are groceries, and right now food co-ops across the country are proving that it's different to shop at a co-op. The food might not be different, but the outcome of what happens with the money that you've spent at the co-op right. is different. Now, what's challenging about Santa Barbara, which we all know, is it's very expensive to live here. It's very expensive to rent buildings here. Right. Groceries have to be priced at a level where somebody's going to want to buy them. And so I believe that the co-op as a small business might be quite limited in terms of opening a store downtown because what it would take to make the money to pull it off seems unfeasible, mm -hmm. also because there's so many places to buy groceries. Right. And we have this beauty of a farmer's market almost every day of the week downtown. Right, exactly. And just to be honest, Santa Barbara often feels like a mm -hmm. farmer's market Trader Joe's sort of community. Yeah. And that's one of our big challenges is how do we distinguish ourselves from the marketing powerhouse that is Trader Joe's? Right, and, and I see Vons and Trader Joe's is that, that I think where they make their money is in wines. Probably, you know, I mean they, the Trader Joe's uh, margin is a unique, I mean Trader Joe's as an entity is really unique. They're because not bananas aren't different. gonna be that much different in your place versus their place, but if they have four rows of wines that they can sell for $40, and they're going to push some of these types of wines on, oh, you're having a wedding or a party, you need this wine. Bananas are 19 cents a pound, or 19 cents each at Trader mm -hmm. Joe's, and it is the most unnerving thing to walk into a grocery store that claims to have any social consciousness, which I believe is great marketing, and the first thing you see is a rack of bananas that completely promote unethical food across this world. I just want to say that for the record, the co-op's bananas are totally different than okay. Trader Joe's bananas. And, what, and, and, and I'm watching and I'm looking at our, at our time here, yeah. and I'm, I'm going to give you our last question, because, yeah. because clearly you have to be on the show again. I mean, you know, I, I mean, we've got all of our questions in such time, <laughs> but, but there's so many things to talk about yeah, because yeah, I've become sort of a foodie in my own right. So, so the Isla Vista Food Co-op is, is where in Isla Vista? Give us the address. Just right off the main loop at 6575 Seville Road, best enter in on Camino Pescadero. And what's your website? Uh, islavistafood.coop, we are a .coop, okay. .co -op, and you can follow us on Instagram. Even if you don't have an Instagram, we suggest going to instagram.com slash islavistafoodcoop. We love putting all of our Well, we're going to get you on Facebook and YouTube here in the next couple of days. Thank you. For TV Santa Barbara, Melissa Cohen, thank you thank for you this. It was so a much, wonderful Eric. interview. That and this great. is Eric Durack for MedHealth Fit. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>